I like that he tried to cheat at least. Probably should have cheated a little bit harder, in my opinion. I'm saying it. All right. I want to see this one. Eight months completely alone at sea. It is 1969 and communication with home is limited. It is just you and your mind thinking about all the mistakes you've made in your life that have led you to this point. This is where 36 year old Donald Crowhurst found himself. He now had to make a critical decision. Here you go, your remodded UB. In May 1967, Francis Chichester became the first person to sail around the world solo. He made one stop in Sydney and after nine months alone on the open seas, returned home to England and was greeted by 250,000 well wishes. He was a national hero and was knighted soon after. The following <laughs> year, the British Sunday Times newspaper decided to sponsor the first non-stop solo round the world yacht race. It was an open race with no qualifying requirements as long as competitors started between June 1st and October 31st to ensure they passed through the Southern Ocean during summer. The first person to complete the feat would be awarded with the Golden Globe Trophy, and whoever recorded the fastest time would win 5,000 pounds, equivalent to roughly... Bro, you are... You're aching for it. You are aching for it. You're looking for it right now, young PZ. What, you think you can have a private conversation in my chat of all places? This is the one fucking Twitch streamer's chat where there is no privacy. 70,000 pounds today. Nine men entered the race. All were highly experienced and esteemed yachtsmen and sailors, except for one man, Donald Crowhurst. So Donald Crowhurst was a business owner and amateur sailor from Bridgewater in Somerset, England. Growing up, his family was very poor and Donald had to leave school early when his father died. Like, this is beautiful. It's a beautiful town, you know, stay in your lane, right? Love this. Okay? Love this. It's nice. This is nice. I again, they found the one sunny day to take this photo, but still, I digress. It's nice. Donald worked in the Air Force in the 1950s as a pilot and as an engineer. He married his wife, Claire, in 1957, and together they had four children. In Bridgewater, Donald started his own electronics company, Electron Utilization, and manufactured navigational equipment. Business was slow. Donald made just enough money to feed his family and keep a roof over their heads. He always had a yearning for adventure. I feel like this guy was like too ahead of his time, you know what I mean? And begun to feel like he hadn't used his skills and abilities to achieve his full potential. When Donald heard about the Golden Globe race around the world, he felt compelled to enter. If he could build a boat using his own electronics and inventions, then complete the race or even win, it would generate a huge amount of publicity. He would become a national hero like Francis Chichester. He believed this was his chance to completely turn his life around. While other competitors already had boats that just needed some modifications, Donald needed to build one from scratch. He came up with a modified trimaran design that would be equipped with advanced electronics that would make it faster and safer. The only thing missing was money. Donald mortgaged his house and secured two sponsors, the town of Tidmouth in Devon and local businessman Stanley Best, an investor of Donald's company, Electron Utilization. The vessel was named Tidmouth Electron after its two sponsors. Donald could finally get to work on his boat and was optimistic about his adventure. However, his money issues were just the first of many, many problems that would arise. Donald was convinced that the trimaran model with the hulls on either side of the main hull would be ideal for speed as well as safety. He believed it was the best option to get him across the choppy waters of the Southern Ocean. He planned to install additional safety measures he designed himself as well as a revolutionary computer that would sense when the boat was tipping and trigger a flotation device. The Tinmouth Electron was designed with very few non-essentials so it would be lightweight and therefore travel faster. The living quarters were considerable. Chat, not all Australians sound the same. Y'all are being fucking anti-Aussie right now, okay? No, this is not I did a thing. Or is it? Or fucking is it, mate? ...smaller than those of Donald's fellow competitors. 
he also only brought five this books is, I have to done be something. up to eight or nine months at sea. With the October 31st deadline looming closer and budget running out, Donald had to rush to complete the boat. He was forced to cut corners. He had to forego his computer and made some less than ideal substitutions on various parts of the boat. On top of everything, Stanley Best, one of the sponsors, made Donald sign an agreement. If Donald dropped out of the race before it began, or if he dropped out early on, he would have to pay back the cost of the Tinmouth Electron, which would completely bankrupt him. Everything was on the line. He had no choice but to successfully complete the round the world race. On September 23rd, Donald sailed the Tinmouth Electron on its maiden voyage to its namesake and sponsor town. Donald's publicity officer believed officially starting the race from Tinmouth would attract visitors and press and boost the image and economy of the town. The voyage to Tinmouth was supposed to take three days, but ended up taking two weeks. Donald's wife Claire was tasked with christening the boat by releasing a champagne bottle tied to a ribbon. But the bottle didn't smash and instead bounced off the hull, which is considered bad luck. One of the boat's builders quickly grabbed the bottle and smashed it by hand. The boat was damaged on its maiden voyage, and it was also discovered that it could not perform windward. In other words, it could not travel against the wind, but there was no time for repairs. The other competitors had already begun their journeys. In fact, Two men had already dropped out of the race when they reached the Southern Ocean. There was no chance Donald could win the Golden Globe Trophy, the first man home, but there was still the £5,000 cash prize for the fastest time. In the days leading up to the deadline, it was total chaos. Donald and the boat builders were scrambling to get everything done, but they were dangerously behind schedule. Donald was also proving to be a clumsy sailor and was imprecise with navigation. He simply wasn't ready. It was a terrible predicament. Either he drops out of the race, goes bankrupt and plunges his family into poverty, or he takes the unfinished boat out to sea to face near certain death. The night before the deadline, Donald confessed to his sponsor, Stanley Best, about the issues. But Stanley reminded him of the agreement, and the next day, Donald got ready to start the race. On the 31st of October, 1968, Crowds gathered in Tinmouth to watch 36-year-old Donald Crowhurst begin his solo voyage around the world. Donald farewelled his wife Claire and his four children and took off. However, immediately there was an issue with the sails and the boat had to be towed back for repairs. Finally, at the very last moment before the race deadline, Donald departed on the Tinmouth Electron and before long, he was just a tiny speck on the horizon. There is... I feel like there was a lot of opportunities for him to just be like, all right, fuck this shit, I'm out. Ocean Gate Zero? No, dude. This kind of vo voyage was conducted. Oh, sorry. I just burped in the microphone like Sean Hannity. This kind of stuff was done so many times before this guy, and it will continue to be done. I mean, couldn't that would mean losing everything? Yeah, except here's a better way to do it. Uh, uh, you know, not doing it and then not dying which i don't even know if that's what happened but it seems like that's probably what's going to happen you know what i mean it's ominous and i'm not saying that because of the fucking australian accent they forced him and he go bankrupt yeah that's what i mean i'll be like all right well i don't want to fucking die so you know uh not doing that Modern sea vessels have GPS and internet access and are able to maintain communication lines at all times. In the 1960s, the only way for boats out at sea to communicate with land was via radio calls and telegrams. There were no satellites that could pinpoint your exact location. You couldn't text or FaceTime anyone. You were truly and utterly alone in the vast <laughs> and unforgiving expanse <laughs> Wait, of the ocean. Wait, no. That's Donald crazy. Donald had a long journey ahead of him. First down to the South Atlantic, past the Cape of Good Hope, where he would then hit the Roaring Forties. The lack of large land masses in the Southern Ocean causes extremely strong westerly winds, creating endless storms that circle the planet, producing waves of up to 10 meters or 33 feet high. Yeah, this shit terrifies the fuck out of me. It's like being at the top of the hour and not having a, uh, an ad break avoidance fee. 
like not having five dollars or a Twitch Prime to use on the channel, it's just not happening. You know what I mean? Not for me. Some OnlyFans girl said she would pay if you do a video with her. Uh, who is it? I mean, I'm not going to do it, but it's still funny. Also, yeah, no shit. It's my mom return her calls. Thanks, white guy one. Yeah, I don't know if that guy's being. Anyway, she should, she should pay for people to no longer see the ads at the top of the hour by gifting subs. Yeah, white guy one, thanks. Probably Adam 22's wife, I assume. is He's making a joke about Lena the plug, right? How about you plug your credit card number in there to subscribe for $5 to avoid the top of the hour ad break? Here's the streaming ad break now. Yeah, this I, is the first white guy. Thousands and thousands of miles later, he would pass the south of Australia and New Zealand and sail across the Pacific to Cape Horn, where the seas are very violent. Finally, he would sail north. Wait, how does that work, chat? Look. Look at this. He went from one side of the map and then comes out of the other side. How does that work? I don't get it. It's the gape horn. There's a big gape there. Fucking hell. It's like the snake game. Is there like a portal there? Is that what it is? He has to hit that gape. And it's like a portal, and then it comes out of the other side. Boop, like that. Teleportation. Of past the equator, back into the Atlantic, and home to Britain. That was the plan, anyway. Donald struggled with his boat for the first few weeks of his voyage. It was unfinished, damaged, and leaking. And any fixes he could make would certainly not survive the turbulent southern seas. The BBC provided him with the camera and tape recorder, and Donald did a good job of appearing like everything was going well. But his logbook... Here's the thing I don't get. Wait, how do they know? How <laughs> At the time, how, how does he prove it? I guess there's like landmarks there, but... Isn't there... I feel like you could cheat it a little bit, no? Well, I guess not. You go to, the, you go to New Zealand. Finally, he would sail north past the equator. He wrote about how he believed his chances of survival were, quote, 50-50, and that soon he would have to make, quote, a bloody awful decision. Meanwhile, three more men had dropped out of the race due to illness and dangerous conditions. Robin Knox Johnston was in the lead. For over a month, Donald made slow progress in the race while he agonized over what to do. Continue the race in a boat that was falling apart and drown? Give up, drop out of the race, and face financial ruin. Th that's easy. That's an easy decision, man. It's the second one. You know what I mean? It's the second one, I'm pretty sure. It's just, yeah. The other one is like, you also die. In one, you're in financial ruin, but you're alive. In the other, I don't know, just like take your boat, <laughs> leave your family behind, Take your boat and just, you know, live your life in an entirely different location. Just live, become a New Zealander. The accent's not that far off. You can understand how they speak. Or he could lie about his positions, hang tight in the South Atlantic for a few months, and then sail home to Britain. The competitors were required to report their positions regularly via radio or telegram. Okay. From December 6th, Donald began reporting vague and sometimes cryptic, false positions and never specified coordinates. He claimed to be much further ahead than where he actually was. Those back home were now getting excited that Donald was making record time and catching up with the other competitors. Newspapers were comparing Donald to Francis Chichester. In mid-December, Donald reported he was advancing rapidly towards the Southern Ocean. He logged his false positions and planned to come in third or fourth in the race to avoid close scrutiny of his logbooks. He planned out all his fake positions, then started a secret logbook with his real positions. At the time, he filmed and recorded himself playing the part of the positive, competent sailor. On Christmas Eve, 1968, Donald made a radio call to his wife, Claire. 
He couldn't tell her about his plan and Claire couldn't tell him about how she was worried sick. Both of them put on a happy, confident front for the press. He was off. I like that he tried to cheat at least. Probably should have cheated a little bit harder, in my opinion. Just to give a precise position, but refused. He's in the town's river. And stated that he was, quote, off Cape Town, which was much further than the fake position he had planned out earlier. In mid-January, Donald lied and reported he was having issues with his radio and had to shut it off. Due to the radio silence. Wait, technically cheating in that situation actually is bad for him. Right? Because then they can't really figure out his precise coordinates to save him either. Not that anybody would because he's broke. Because he's not like a rich guy anyway. I assume. I forgot that like him lying about his coordinates made it worse. Oops. Once newspapers began to exaggerate Donald's estimated position to create excitement. The man coming in second place, Nigel Tetley, began to feel the pressure. Believing that Donald was closing in on him. In what the fuck? Yo, he was having a much chiller time, dude. Yo, he was having a much chiller time, brother. He's just like at the fucking front of the race. How did he do that? He was probably richer, right? I assume Nigel Tetley was actually rich. Sailing is a rich man's game. My man's having like his English roast ass looking meal here. Okay, what did he... Also, how does he have all that food at that point in the race? What did you kill a fucking seagull? Like, what are you doing? There's a guy who took a fucking... The guy who took a photo of him with him, too. Nigel Tetley began to feel the pressure, believing that Donald was closing in on him. In reality, Donald was sailing aimlessly along the east coast of Brazil, waiting for others to pass him as they headed north back to Britain. On March 8th, 1969, Donald desperately needed to make repairs on his boat and stopped at the tiny settlement of Rio Salado in Argentina, breaking the rules of the race. His arrival was logged by the Coast Guard, but he managed to get away without anyone realizing who he was. Donald then decided to head south to film and experience the Southern Ocean conditions to make his logs seem more legitimate. The more Donald fabricated his logs, the harder it became for him to officially drop out of the race, as he was nowhere near his reported positions. On April 22nd, Robin Knox Johnston completed his voyage and won the Golden Globe Trophy. Oh, no. Oh, no. And he got fucking cooked, mate. Becoming the first person to sail solo nonstop around the world. It took him 312 days. By now, Donald Crowhurst and Nigel Tetley were the only two people left in the race and it was a head-to-head -head battle for the £5,000 cash prize. Nigel Tetley's boat was in very bad shape at this point, but he decided to push harder in order to win the fastest time. On May 20th, Nigel Tetley ran into a storm which caused his boat to start breaking apart. He abandoned ship and dropped out of the race. Wait, Suddenly, how? Donald found himself exactly where- Wait, 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 wait. how? That, see, I, okay, see, I don't understand. He abandoned ship, what did he fucking swim? Orcas, like, life raft? He just, like, radioed it in, I'm abandoning ship, so they had to, like, come get him, I guess? Where he didn't want to be. He was the last man standing, and his falsely reported high speeds guaranteed him the 5,000 pound prize. He wanted to avoid close examination of his logbooks, but now it was inevitable. He had calculated fake positions to write down in his logbook, but some of his speeds were unrealistic. Plus, he never actually experienced the roaring 40s and had no idea how accurately he could describe the conditions. In mid-June, Donald and his publicity agent exchanged telegrams about television appearances, interviews, and how a fleet of boats and helicopters were waiting to welcome Donald my man is like, my man is fucking out there just communicating with his PR guy, bro. Oh my God. Time. Over the next several days, the Tinmouth Electron drifted in the mid-Atlantic untended as its captain descended into a deeply disturbed state. It's hard to imagine how Donald must have been feeling at this stage. He had already endured eight months of total solitude while also battling the harsh conditions of the open seas. 
He couldn't Uh-oh. drop out of the race as he was far behind his reported positions and he would be exposed as a fraud. He couldn't keep going as his boat likely wouldn't survive. And if it did, he risked being exposed through his fabricated logbook. His reputation as a businessman. It's pretty and funny. Engineer- it's pretty funny because like <coughs> <coughs> It's pretty funny considering that, like, even if he wins, he's still fucked. He would be destroyed and he'd face financial ruin. Desperate, lonely, lost, unable to find a solution. Donald began writing about philosophy and metaphysics. Over the next eight days, he wrote a 25,000 word manifesto that revealed how tortured and disconnected from reality he became. His manifesto average philosophy graduate student by the way these are the these are the moments of mental anguish that's awesome okay average manifesto writer like this is the kind of shit that you need to be in to be able to write a manifesto was rambling and incoherent at times it contained ruminations about mathematical and religious philosophy as well as mental arguments with himself and with Einstein about the purpose of life. He seemed to have concluded that human beings were all part of a game controlled by some higher beings. His mental state- Uh Uh-oh, don't let 2023 Americans catch wind of this, dude. They will believe it. Nowadays, nowadays, you fucking see that? Nowadays, that shit would be fire, okay? That would go hard in the QAnon circuits, dude. Oh my God, if Andrew Tate got these writings and then reread them and played it off as his own, holy shit. Tate had deteriorated so much that he didn't even mention his four children in his writings. Towards the end, the writings became more and more unclear, but alludes to a revelation. Now is revealed the true nature and purpose and power of the game offense. I am what I am and I see the nature of my offense. It is finished. It is finished. It is the mercy. Donald's last log entry was dated July 1st, 1969. The Tinmouth Electron was found abandoned by a cargo ship in the mid-Atlantic. It is presumed that Donald had jumped overboard. Only three of the four logbooks he carried were found, including one with his real positions. The truth was reported in the newspapers. Robin Knox Johnston was the only man who finished the Golden Globe race around the world. He donated... Yeah, more like he cheated better than everybody else. ...the £5,000 cash prize to the Crowhurst family. Today, the remnants of the Tinmouth Electron... Okay, I spoke too soon. He's a good guy. He seems like a really good guy. My bad. I'm sorry. ...on lay abandoned on the Caribbean island of Cayman Brack. Donald Crowhurst's body was never found. Yeah, he was a good guy. That was definitely a good guy move. He didn't jump. He just escaped in the Matrix and the feminists didn't want you to know. I mean, I feel like, what if he made a homie in like the little Rio town that he was in? And then he was like, bro, come save me. Like, and he secretly communicated with them and he told nobody. And then he was like, and now he's just like, he lived out the rest of his lives. He <laughs> lives. He lived out the rest of his life in Brazil. He came to Brazil. The best vid on this channel, by the way. This channel's got some bangers on it, dude. Am Am Glimpse. Am Am Glimpse. I'm I'm hitting them with a sub. I like it. Nah, buddy is Cthulhu at this point. He's in a fucking Davy Jones locker. And he swam to there. The boat was found mid Atlantic. Oh. Rough end for Nigel Tetley. All over lies from this dude. British sailor who was the first person to circumnavigate the world solo in a trimmerin. A native of South Africa and a lieutenant commander in the Royal Navy. Tetley ended the 1968 Sunday Times Golden Globe race, which was the first non-stop single-handed round-the-world yacht race. Tetley sailed the victorious of Plywood a Plywood Trimoran that also doubled as his own. He completed the circumnavigation when he crossed his outgoing trek on the evening of the 22nd of April, 1969. 
But at that point, he was still 5,000 nautical miles from finishing the race and claiming a prize for the fastest passage. The victress at this point was slowly disintegrating, but Tetley thought he was being chased by another trimmer and piloted by Donald Crowers. So instead of nursing his ailing boat along, he continued to sail as hard as he could. The victress broke up and sank under him. Tetley had time to get off a Mayday call before taking his life raft and was picked up the following afternoon. It later turned out that Tetley had not needed to hurry. Donald Crowhurst had faked his round-the-world trip, sailing only in the Atlantic and radioing false position reports. Tetley was never able to raise enough money to completely outfit the new boat, though showing no outward signs of stress or depression. He went missing on the 2nd of February. His body was found three days later, hanging from a tree in the woods near Dover, England. Oh, God. Body had been discovered clothed in lingerie, and the hens were bound behind the back. The opinion offered by a pathologist suggested masochistic sexual activity. The coroner, noting that there was no evidence that Tetley had deliberately taken his life, recorded an open verdict. Oh, he was just into uh, self... He was into, you know, choking himself. Autoerotic asphyxiation. I feel like, I feel like when you die doing that, though, you die doing what you love. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like that's, that's got to be like the biggest nut you've ever had. You know what I mean? With his hands tied behind his back? Wait. Oh, never mind. Somebody did that to him. Oh, shit. Oops, never mind. Somebody did that to him. <sighs> oh, yeah, you cracked the case? Listen, I'm stupid.